when you start reducing blood cholesterol levels, you're putting brain under grave danger. Because brain has cell regeneration processes going on all the time. Cells in the brain do die. And if the blood cholesterol is low, the brain is not getting enough to maintain its structure and to function properly. People with low blood cholesterol have aggressive personalities and poor self-control. People who actually give a fuck about animals do not give up on them. They do not throw them in a stir fry when they feel hungry or gassy or get a pimply face. They take responsibility and they do not stop until they find a cruelty-free answer to the issue. These people, they fly off the handle, they become aggressive or they attack. And that is a part of any mental illness. Suddenly, fish aren't fucking animals. You were not vegan. I've had 11 major injuries where I've been out for months on end. They've taken three to four months to heal, mainly bone injuries and fractures. And before people say, you didn't do it right, I was vegan for three and a half, four years. I tried every single version of veganism and I didn't jump from one to the other. I spent a long period of time, pretty much a year, trying out each one. I tried high carb, low fat. I tried low carb, high fat, keto vegan, raw vegan. I tried fruitarian for a week. And I, I couldn't change how I felt. I still wake up in the morning feeling exhausted skin condition, psoriasis, anxiety, depression, teeth rotting really fast in the past year. <sighs> My race has just been absolute shit for the past three years. There's a difference between having legs aching from running lots and genuinely feeling like you have an illness. Last week, at a state, I'm not joking. I got, I just, I felt so ill. I, I wanted to try it. I just thought, right, that's it. I thought you meant to feel good in a vegan diet. I'm eating leafy greens. I'm eating nuts. I'm eating seeds. Whole food plant based, Dr. Gregor, you know? Dr. Gregor. What, the bold guy that wears magnifying glasses because you can't see his eyesight so bad and looks anorexic and pale. You can have blood cell, um, a red blood cell can become anemic. But all the vegans quote his studies. Now hang on, if you look on the live streams, he cherry picks all the studies. He says he picks the most interesting ones. Sure, my name is Dr. Michael Greger. I'm, I'm a physician, author, speaker, run a website called nutritionfacts.org, um, uh, which offers free daily updates on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. I mean, I remember seeing studies like, if you eat one egg a day, it's the equivalent of three cigarettes a day. As I noted last year, the Harvard Nurses Health Study found that the daily consumption of the amount of cholesterol found in just a single egg appeared to cut a woman's life short as much as smoking 25,000 cigarettes, five cigarettes a day for 15 years. Following up on that research, a study in the journal Atherosclerosis found that just three eggs or more a week was associated with a significant increase in artery clogging plaque buildup in the in people's carotid arteries going to their brain, a strong predictor of stroke, heart attack, and death. How much poison you want to eat? If I, and you could correct me on my facts here, but Dr. Greger's uh, you started out in general medicine, but never really have seen many patients, have you? No, it was really just my postgraduate medical training. Yeah, I was never in clinical medicine for, um, uh, you know, uh, longer than that. I went directly to uh, 
actually went as soon as I got out, um, uh, where I started traveling around speaking in medical schools, feeling that, you know, how many people can I treat in a day, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it was more important to train the trainers. And so went on the road and talked to other, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and I believed this. I was like, Oh my God, me, you know, I bet I, I really am having a mental crisis right now, and I'm sorry if you're vegan and you're gonna unsub. I couldn't give a shit. My health is more important than saving cows and chickens, right? I, the fruit production is giving tons of people in Africa and the Middle East, Ghana, a cancer epidemic because of the chemicals they spray on the bananas. You don't hear about that. They seem to care about animals more than they do humans. And I believe if we're meant to be vegan and it's our natural her herbivorous, if we're herbivorous animals, then why the hell are there absolutely no indigenous primal tribes around the world that are vegan, even vegetarian? Breast milk has the highest level of ketones of any natural food. Human brain growth is totally dependent on dietary fats, but particularly the 2022 carbon chain uh, fatty acids, uh, dicosexanoic and arachidonic acid. In other words, dietary animal source fats. Not olive oil, not avocado oil, you know. So, um, I think that 10% might be a little conservative, maybe a lot conservative with some individuals, but anyway. So the study from the American Journal of Physiology found that, quote, a ketogenic state results in a substantial 39% increase in cerebral blood flow and appears to reduce cognitive dysfunction associated with systemic hypoglycemia in normal humans, not even in diabetics or people in, you know, neurologically compromised states. We're talking about normal people can increase their cerebral blood flow 39% just by making this metabolic change. That's remarkable. <laughs> so what are the effects of sugar and starch anyway? Um, so, you know, chronic, you know, surges of blood sugar are, and I can tell you from experience because I work with people all the time and I see changes in people that make these dietary changes. These are a common source of depression, anxiety, mania, mood swings, hyperactivity, irritability, violent tendencies, and and cognitive or attention related dysfunction. And, you know, apart from these obvious effects and general mood disposition issues, you know, this also chronic blood sugars also cause us to lose a lot of magnesium. Our kidneys dump magnesium every time we have a blood sugar surge and the body doesn't hang on to magnesium well anyway. And we have to have that for normal, calm, parasympathetic functioning. And of course you need insulin in a store intracellular magnesium and then magnesium is needed to produce and utilize insulin. So, oh yeah, and magnesium loss also results in elevated histamine levels and histamine functions like an excitatory neurotransmitter in people. You know, if they have seasonal allergies and things like that, histamine is really agitating to the nervous system. Insulin and leptin surges are also pro-inflammatory. The excess carbs lead to this increased demand for B complex and especially B1 and B6. You know, it can you know lead you to deficiencies. Even though it increases the serotonin availability in the bloodstream, ultimately it's depleting because it's not giving you the raw materials to make more. It's just putting it out there so that your body can deplete it. High carb diets tend to be poor protein utilization diets, um, and it can encourage things like yeast overgrowth, which we know has a whole plethora of you know, potential psychiatric, you know, neurological, emotional kinds of symptoms. Uh, you know, blood sugar surges and, and blood sugar dysregulation leads to sleep disturbances, hyper, hypoglycemia, reactive hypoglycemia, premature aging, you know, all good stuff. Decline in mental health around the world has a lot to do with the decline of the, in the quality of our diet over the past 75 years, and I think that's catching up with us. Um, and I, I believe that it may be one of the primary driving factors behind many mental illnesses. The other diet that I'm very worried about as a psychiatrist um, that's on the rise around the world is the plant-based diet. And I'm someone that's tested the vegan diet to the extreme. I've tried all the different types 
and I've, I put it under the microscope and I've said, right, let's see what you can do. And I trained my body. I kept training really hard and I felt awful. And then I backed off and did nothing, just rested for months. And I still felt awful. You just sit, you chill and do nothing. Watch a movie. I still felt awful, like I'd just finished running an ultra marathon or something. And I'm just not performing. You know, I make these claims and I try so hard and I, I can see it in my head. But my body's just like, no. It's literally like, it's, you know, like, it's hard to find a vegan that's been vegan for three, four years, you know, that doesn't have ruined teeth, rotten teeth, doesn't have mental issues, that isn't extremely skinny. It's not a stereotype. Vegans, more than three, four years, they start to waste away. And then, I guess through confirmation bias, you start to just really attract and, and gravitate to what you want to believe. So, um, I just continued with it and there were times, to be perfectly honest, I, I couldn't maintain it for myself. I would end up cheating and I always would cheat with the same thing, which was raw fish, but obviously not the veganism. And so I would eat some raw fish and I would feel really, really guilty about it, but I would notice that I would feel better. I would have this instant boost and I would just stop it and go another six months or a year or two years vegan. And I would go these long stretches of 100% and then I would find myself, you know, your body just sort of tells you you need something and I'd feel horrible about it. But there I would be eating some sashimi and feeling better and then getting back on the bandwagon. So that was, sort of the journey up until about three years ago I I hit a wall I got extremely sick but I tried everything for about a year juicing and I've done a lot of water fasts and I was a colon hydrotherapist at one point and so I was doing colonics and I even got into dry fasting I was doing everything I, I lost all my ATP I couldn't even open my eyes sometimes and talk So what are the co potential consequences here? And these are things I've seen in my practice. We see serotonin depletion, we see magnesium depletion, vitamin B, B vitamin, B12 insufficiency and malabsorption, irritability, brain fog, cognitive impairment, attentional disorders, depression, anxiety disorders, confusion and memory problems, alcoholism, nervous habits, mental disturbances, eating disorders, sleeping disturbances, emotional ability and reactivity. Don't let this happen to you. Or someone you love. It was just a really, really scary time, and um, we didn't know what was wrong. There were about six times I was hospitalized where, out of the blue, I would go into major tachycardia, if you know what that is, it's just rapid heartbeat, and I would also lose, like, complete ability to, you know, almost even open my eyes. I could barely open my eyes. I could barely talk. I could just whisper, and um, my friend who's a nurse, Jane, came over one night because we needed some help. Uh, I was lying on the couch here actually and my, my husband couldn't get me to the toilet by himself. I know this is just so embarrassing, but this is the truth. I was so completely wiped out. And so she came over to help. She's a nurse and she really thought I was dying. I was like, you know, I've done martial arts for a lot of my life. I'm an extremely active person. I'm not faking this. I, I can't move. I, if, without my husband helping me, I couldn't do anything. This went on for, on and off for nine months, but mostly on. I was pretty much bedridden. So I um, really was scared. And in the last four months, I started adding in some animal products and I have just boosted. Like I'm not 100% yet, but I am feeling better than I have felt in the year. Many of you have heard Raise your hand if you haven't heard me do the metabolic wood stove analogy. I basically see carbohydrates. I think we can, we can look analogously at carbohydrates as being a form of metabolic kindling. And your whole grains, your beans, your brown rice, your sweet potatoes and things like that, you can basically look at as being twigs on that metabolic fire. Now white rice, 
save starch. Give me a break. Um, did I say that out loud? Whoops. Um, white rice, bread, pasta, white potatoes, things like that. The other safe starch. Um, those are basically like crumpled up paper on your metabolic fire. Now, you know, our old friend from, from college, alcohol, <laughs> um, and things like sweetened beverages, etc. Those things, you know, sports drinks, whatever, those are literally like throwing lighter fluid or gasoline on that metabolic fire. Now, if, if, if you had to heat your house, you know, using nothing but a wood stove, and all you had was kindling to run that stove to heat your house with, you could do it. And guess what? 99% of our culture does it that way all the time. In fact, this is happening all over the world. But what is what are you actually doing? You are dev you are basically establishing a, sh a slave relationship with that wood stove. You're pulled up to the door of that wood stove and you're spending all day long grabbing handfuls of fuel to try to keep that fire going. You have a preoccupation with where the next handful of food is going to come from, right? The next handful of full of fuel. Constantly looking, carrying those snacks around, you know, throwing more kindling on the fire all the time. And, um, you know, you're basically perpetually hungry. Now think who profits from that. On the other, and I can't think of a single multinational corporation actually anywhere on planet Earth that wouldn't be heavily invested in every man, woman, and child on this planet being entirely dependent on a, on a, a being primarily dependent on carbohydrates for their for their main fuel because it's cheap as hell to produce it's extremely profitable and it keeps you perpetually hungry Monsanto's gotta love that I'm just saying so on the other hand you know, what's the alternative to this well, what if you're you know about to, what if you take a nice big fat log and throw that on the fire now you're free you can walk away you can sleep all the way through the night without waking up at 3 a.m. feeling anxious. And yes, there you know is an analogy to be made here, thinking, <gasps> fire's going out, got to do something. Oh my God, look in the wood stove. I got to start lighter fluid, paper, whatever. Um, you throw the log on the fire, you go about your business and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Or not anymore, but you can you can do other things. And then you... You know, you wake up in the morning, you look in the, in the, you know, in the stove, and it's like, oh, yeah, fire's burning down. I'll throw another log on, and you're free. I don't know anything that has ever been more freeing in my life than this. I mean, if I get up in the morning, and I don't have time to eat, and I dash out the door, whatever, you know, noon, one o'clock, I'm thinking, hmm, I know I'm kind of hungry. But my mood, cognitive, and energy equation is not dependent on sugar. It's dependent on fat as its primary source of fuel. And therefore, you know, there's, there's, there's no vacillation. I'm not living on a roller coaster. You know, how do you know if you have a blood sugar problem or not? I've got two questions for you. Number one, if you haven't eaten for six or seven hours, how you doing? You know, are you feeling fatigued? Are you feeling, you know, um, are you feeling confused, brain fogged? Are you feeling kind of irritable or cranky or agitated or a little something that rhymes with itchy, as I like to say? <laughs> um... And then the second question is, how do you feel after you eat? Do you immediately feel better? Do you immediately feel like, oh, I got a whole new lease on life. Yeah, baby, let's take it on. Or are you feeling like, you know, I'm going to kind of unzip my pants a little, sit on the couch and take a nap for a bit. If you answer yes to any of these, you've got a problem. This is not normal just simply because it is common. This is not the way we were designed to exist. How are you, you're know, like, well, how the hell am I supposed to feel if I haven't eaten for seven hours? There's only one right answer, and that answer is hungry. How are you supposed to feel after you eat? The only answer, the only thing you're supposed to feel normally is not hungry. If it's anything else, you've got a problem. And, you know, grains, I mean, you wouldn't eat grains raw, would you? You don't fucking burn. Okay. So anytime you have neurological, cognitive, attentional, or mood-based issues, you have to look at gluten as a potential issue. I'm not saying it's always the case, but that has to be ruled out every single time. This is, you know, you hear people say only 1% of the population has it. No, only 1% to 3% of the population has ever been diagnosed. And only 12% of what constitutes gluten immune reactivity is actually full-blown celiac disease. Non-celiac disease is the rest of that iceberg. And it's, it's affecting at least 25% of the population. I think that that number is low. We know that it's a factor, it either a causative or exacerbating factor in 
virtually all autoimmune disease, you have to have a gut-based problem and they have to have total villous atrophy in order to be diagnosed with celiac disease. But, you know, th 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 these are very real issues. And there is no one on this planet for whom gluten is an actual food. There is not a person alive, according to Lucio Fasano. He will tell you that there's no human being on earth that can actually digest gluten. So it's not even food. It's just a contaminant in our, in our food supply. And whether or not, uh, yeah, whether or not you have gluten immune reactivity, it's a potential problem, but I'll get to that. This is a quote from the Journal of Neurology, more to the point here, that gluten sensitivity can be primarily and at times exclusively a neurological disease, affecting not only the brain and nervous system directly, but also cognitive and psychiatric illness. The most common neuropsychiatric disturbance for gluten immune reactivity is depression, followed by anxiety and migraines. So the Journal of Neuro, uh, Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry states that our finding implies that immune response triggered by sensitivity to gluten may find expression in organs other than the gut, and the central and peripheral nervous systems are particularly susceptible. But where is Western medicine looking for gluten sensitivity? They're looking for it here. If it's not here, it doesn't exist. But the literature is absolutely clear. I mean, it, 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 it's suffocating how much literature there is in this arena but it's just simply not being addressed. Whereas plant foods all are missing certain key uh, nutrients and they, uh, some of them are in the wrong form and harder for us to use and they uh, contain anti-nutrients which interfere with our ability to absorb them or utilize them. And there are many, many examples of these, um, but uh, uh, just a few to call to your attention, particularly um, phytic acid which is a mineral magnet that interferes with our ability to absorb minerals. And these minerals are really important for brain function. So um, phytic acid is particularly rich in the grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, which are the staple foods of plant-based diets. Anti-nutrients are chemicals, natural chemicals in plants that are there for their own purposes. But many of them interfere with our ability to utilize nutrients uh, not only from the plant foods that we eat, but from the animal foods that we eat along with those plant foods. And I want to call your attention to a couple of them. Uh, you know, uh, soy, which is a, 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 an important staple protein food for people who choose a plant-based diet, uh, interferes, interferes with iodine uh, utilization, and that can impact thyroid function. And thyroid function is very important for the brain. Uh, and then the grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, which are really important, crucial elements of a plant-based diet because they, are, they do contain protein, they are rich in phytic acid. And phytic acid is a mineral magnet that interferes with uh, minerals like iron, zinc, calcium, and magnesium. So uh, why is this important? It's important because, again, remember the brain needs more nutrients than many other parts of the body because of its activity. And, uh, and these nutrients are really key to brain function. If you are deficient in these, uh, your brain may not be working uh, at top speed. Um, um, I've, I just think, I never, had, I never had the psoriasis all over my skin, all over my stomach, all over my um, back of my legs, psoriasis all the time. Even though I'm eating a clean vegan diet, you know, when I try and eat just fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, quinoa, Most of oxalate is a plankton size nanocrystal relative to the whales. That, these are mega whales. These are gigantic in plants. So in plants, they belong. In human tissue, that's a pathology. See the, the bars and chunky stuff in here? That's human tissue. Where is it in our foods? Super high oxalate foods include things you know about. They happen to be the same foods that we are promoting as super fabulous superheroes that are saving our health. Super popular nuts and seeds, extremely high in oxalate. And some more superfoods, high enough in oxalate to cause illness. Anybody eat any of these things? How often? Every day. Now, probably in Paleolithic times, that wasn't happening every day. So what is oxalate toxicity? Too much in the body. It doesn't work. I've tried it. It's taking B12, vitamin D3, iron, you know, all the, the multivitamins, 
the seeds, flax seeds. I got desperate and I tried all forms of veganism. And year after year, I got worse and worse, sicker and sicker. My anxiety, depression, and I don't want to, I don't like the way of saying my anxiety, because it's not yours, it's something you're going through, and there's a reason why. And with me, I didn't get, I wasn't getting the nutrients, I was just freaking out, my body's starving, I'm losing weight, even though I'm piling in tons of food. Lots of butter, lamb fat, beef fat, goose fat, duck fat. The fattiest bits, that is their food. Only then they recover. Good idea to give it some help by eating high cholesterol foods. It's had a great meal. You know, when you go to most conferences, after lunch, everybody's asleep. And we're awake because, you know, we're getting human appropriate food. You know, you're, you're formerly a vegan. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, can you recommend that diet for anybody? Do you think it's. No. Do you think anybody should do that diet? Not in the least. I do have um, a couple of followers who are vegan and I'm glad I do. I want to see how well they can do. I, um, one person in particular, he started in December this year, so it's very new for him, but he had a lot of, uh, I think it is ankle pain and that's helped him tremendously. So even on a deficient diet that's going to you know, make you old before your time and and make you suffer ultimately, even that diet, you can reverse a lot of pain on the low oxalate diet. And what I'm finding with my clients is, I'm shocked at how many vegans have actually stopped being vegans because of my education with them. I just got an email today, if we had time, I would read it to you. I just got it at 11 or 10 this morning from a vegan who's really been struggling with this idea. She's committed her life, her body, her, her vocation, so to speak, to this idea of being the healthy vegan. And she did that for 20 something years and then she went raw vegan and she is on death's door. She's very sick and she's, you know, I'm, we're working her through this process. So anybody who's really sick, I, I have a history of working with people with eating disorders and I understand compulsive eating and I understand the anxiety and the fear. And of course, if your brain is deficient because you haven't had butter in years and good fat, your, your level of fear and you're like a deer in the headlights. If you're a sick vegan and you, you suddenly realize that the thing you've, you've gambled on your whole life on this idea, it is heartbreaking. It is so difficult for them. And I, I feel such pain for them and I, I'm just impressed with any of them who can turn that around because many of these folks, it's they're not a white person or a mom or a, or a Girl Scout leader in their identity. Who they are is a vegetarian. Who they are is vegan. Like that's what makes them special. And so this is a big spiritual crisis for people. And I, I'm just impressed that anybody can walk away from that because it's it's a cult and it's very hard to save people from that. And I, I just, you know, again, I get a little emotional about it because I, I feel how difficult it is. And I'm, I just, my hat's off to anybody who can walk away from that and, and choose their own health over these ideas that were basically lies. They've been manipulated by forces and it's not their fault. So guys, we're on day 48 of ex vegan journey now i have had so many comments messages emails snapchats instagram dms from vegans trying to help me out and support me back into veganism so i wanted to make a video today to address those messages and answer am i actually gonna go back vegan again so as i said i'm on day 48 of ex-veganism and I have never ever had this much energy probably the last time I had this much energy was back when I was a kid the amount of energy I have gained the amount of motivation inspiration just inner energy and strength for my training for my daily life just social life just everything has increased since I've left veganism not only that but when I eat my meals I no longer have to cram in buckets full of carbohydrates to try not to feel hungry all the time like when I was vegan but I can have literally a normal portion and I can feel satiated and full 
after I've eaten it. Like I can go for hours without having to stuff a load more food into my mouth. So a lot of people have been telling me, Brandon, if you really were vegan, you would do anything, anything to find out your health problems. You would go to the doctors, you would do this, you would do that. You would do anything but eat an animal product to help your health. So here's the thing that gets me. If I go back to being vegan and you'll all be, ha you'll all be happy and I continue to lose weight and I continue to approach anorexia for my height, you'll still be happy as long as I'm vegan. I could be in the hospital with heart failure. I could be in the hospital with extreme B12 deficiency, but as long as I'm vegan and I'm saving the cows, chickens and the planet, then you are happy. You vegans are happy. The vegetarian way of eating, which many people are, are turning to because of climate change and so on, doesn't nurture the human being, doesn't nurture our bodies, and it doesn't, and it's destroying the planet. Right. Have it right? Yeah. So let's, un let's, let's unpack those two and talk to us about why isn't a vegetarian diet, which sounds like the right way to go, why isn't it good for people? Well, there's a human template that needs certain nutritional elements, and they are not provided by a vegetarian diet. Um, well, you can go back four million years to the very beginning of the human race, and there is no question that we were hunters. This is what we ate for literally four million years. And it's the reason we have really big brains. We have the largest brain of any primate, and we have the smallest digestive tract, which is to say, how are you going to feed that brain? I mean, our brains use 25% of the energy, our energy needs. And you're not going to get that out of plants. There just isn't enough energy. So it's quite clear that we must have been eating meat to get brains that are this large. Um, and, you know, the other thing that you find in the archaeological record is that Humans are long and tall and strong, and they keep all their teeth, and, and their bones are disease-free until you hit agriculture. And then suddenly everybody shrinks six inches, and they lose their teeth, and their bones are riddled with disease. Whoa. And we have a concept, the diseases of civilization. There is no such thing as the diseases of hunter-gatherers. Let me back up for a second mm -hmm. here. Part of how you got into this is you yourself were a vegan yes. for 20 years. So 20 we're years. Lo you're looking at not anything from any animals, right? right? Because mm. here you can you know, stop oppressing animals, and you can stop hurting the earth, and you can feed hungry people, and there's this whole, it's, it makes a total picture. You get this complete plan if you just eat this way. And so... And it's wonderful, and it's honorable, and it's laudable, and you can do just that, and, and, it, and it affects much more than just yourself. Yeah, except none of it's true. <laughs> and that's the problem. None of it's true. Um, it was really hard. And eventually, when I had to give up being a vegan, all that information, I was finally able to really examine it and embrace it more fully. Um, but it's a, it's a long, hard process, and I know that it's, it's very painful for most people. Um, and, you know, well, there's a whole generation of us now who have been through this. I mean, we tried really? it. It didn't really? work. Really? Our health collapsed, and then we had to find something new. Which means you're starving everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah, right. From your brain on down. Which, people who eat low-fat diets lot. have, like, four times the suicide rate. And not just suicide, but violent death and murder rate. So, you know, you're not stable when you don't get enough fat. The brain, here's what was happening. We were increasing our brain volume by three times. Um, so, this, the important consequence of this was that if we gave up, or since we gave up, all of this intestinal tissue, and we still needed all that energy, we needed it for the brain, and we've, we, we've given up the ability to get that energy by fermenting fiber into fat. And it had to come from somewhere, and it had to come from somewhere consistently over a long period of time. Now, if we were talking about right now, where we have uh, plants that we have bred to be more full of glucose, and where we have cooking, which developed quite late, um, we would be able to use possibly tubers or other plants to get that energy. But at the time of our evolution, we, the plants that were available were simply too fibrous and too low in protein and too seasonal to provide that over the span of the lifetime that it was needed, the span of the generations that it was needed, and the geological times that it was needed. This picture on the left shows a Hadzaman that's from a modern hunter-gatherer society that 
does get some of their energy from tubers. He's cooking these. They're very fibrous. They're very low in energy. And even by cooking, which we didn't have for most of that time, only about 25% of the glucose that's in there can be even extracted. Whereas on the other hand, the animals that were available at the time were much fatter. The megafauna that we were hunting was much fatter than the lean game that's left to us now. And th that was able to provide for us all the energy that we needed. We just have a lot of examples of peoples around the world who have been able to eat, somehow thrive without plant matter in their diet. Carnivore diet, again, yes. Many, many times I hear Bobby, I switched to the carnivore diet and I'm making all kinds of gains. 